Coming to you live at the Gamma Trade Show at the Peppermill Resort and Casino in Reno, Nevada, Twist Gaming! Now take it away, Matt. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. This is Twist Gaming. I'm Matt, and we are live here at Gamma 2019 in Reno, bringing you all the board game coverage all week long. Uh, but right now, I'm joined with James from Cheap Ass Games. Did you shoot that drone shot of the Pepper Mill? It's gorgeous. Oh, no, no, no. I, <laughs> I definitely stole that from the Pepper Mill's marketing material Perfect. on YouTube. <laughs> also, it's exactly the weather we're having today. It is, it is pretty nice. I, I mean, know. despite our view of the construction. This is a right show there. where I never go outside. I, yeah. Like, like the, 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 the hotel has everything, and all the people are here, and there's not much nearby. I'll put it mildly. Oh, yeah. So basically, we come here for a week and just have impromptu meetings in the hallway for 24 hours a day yep. for five days. Uh, enjoy Biscotti's Cafe over and over and over again. Right? Uh, there was quite a line for that this morning. <laughs> I'm glad I wasn't hungry, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you got to pick your times for that, I think. Yeah. So, James, uh, how's the convention treating you? Or the trade show, rather. You know, it's uh, it's an interesting year for me. I'm in the process of, of selling cheap-ass games, mm -hmm. which is... Well, I've always wanted to sell cheap-ass games, and I sold five or six of them, but now it's the whole bunch. It's I'm not really selling the company in a... In a Legal sense, we're we're licensing. You're selling a license the entire catalog. product line to a okay. to a single publisher, Greater Than Games, oh, okay. who does you know Sentinels of the Multiverse, and has several other smaller game companies working with them. And we're going to sort of become one of them. Move all of our inventory to St. Louis and transfer the responsibilities of print buying and warehousing and all the overhead of running a company. Which I'm not good at. So you get the logistics out of the way. Right. And, I, and so I can spend more time doing game design for them and for myself as well. I have a feeling that that's the passion that you have. Yeah, of there, course right? it is, yeah. right? Like, I published my own stuff because nobody would, and that was 20 <laughs> years ago, and I've had limited success <laughs> <laughs> since then. But, but I've never been any good at it, and so it's great to have someone else taking over that responsibility. We always wanted to hand it to somebody who was more competent than us and, and see what they would do with it. So really sort of what it means is for the players it's going to be easier to find our products. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's going to be easier to make new ones. Right. Freeze up your time so you can get creative. Yep. Do the fun stuff. Yep. So, Which means I have nothing to show you. <laughs> 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 no, but, but talk to me about uh, what that's been like now. Freeing up some of the time, does it take like a little bit of a weight off your chest then where you can I, focus in more? In theory. I mean, with a, we still haven't signed this contract yet. So like, it's supposed to finalize the end of the month. And uh, so, no, I still have crushing weight. <laughs> On my shoulders, including for the last few months, we haven't really made much of a plan. Like if I were still uh, driving the boat, I would have I would know what I was bringing out this year. Mm -hmm. And now it's kind of like, well, we'll see what they want to do. And and so yeah, it's uh it's a transition time. I wouldn't say the weight is off my shoulders yet, but we're looking forward to a time when it is. Gotcha. So does that mean that there's a couple of projects that you've been dying to get out the door that you've been able to start to focus more attention on, or you plan to start yeah, to Yeah, I mean, so there's on? things I'm working on now. Uh, there's a back catalog of, of a list, not a catalog, but a list of things that I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, the project that I'm really working on now is uh, a book. It's called Cheap Ass Games in Black and White, mm -hmm. and it's a collection of uh, every game Cheap Ass Games has made. Uh, the in black and white subtitle kind of like focuses it on the early stuff, the the early black and white stuff. But it talks about every game that the company has has made. It's got the rule books, the history, how the games are related, what games sort of came before them, and there's like rough drafts and notes about design and all this. So is the book being marketed then to fellow developers, game developers? I think designers will be interested mm -hmm. in it. I think gamers will be interested in in like seeing the collection, maybe picking up a rule book that they don't have that they've lost or they don't remember or right. there's a bunch of games in the book that don't really need any spare parts so you can play them right out of the book oh really uh yeah like like the, we did two collections called chief herman's holiday fun pack mm -hmm. uh and then chief herman's next big thing which were in them they were themselves collections of free games that we'd run in magazines and so on that just need a poker deck or you know coins or whatever um so they're just rules Okay. And for many of the other games, we're not able to put the cards and the boards like literally in the book, but we're putting print and play versions of them online for free. So if you have the book oh, and you really want to cool. play the game, you just go download it, print it yourself. And that's kind of like the extent of what we're promising right now. It's a Kickstarter campaign, so who knows what we're going to promise by the end of it, right? But but right now it's like these are the print and plays. Mm -hmm. During the campaign, we're actually posting a new print and play every day. Every day, every update. So I've got 30 games already in the can. And of course, by new, I mean different because right. they're this, the old games from the right, right, right. back catalog. New, but, quote, um, unquote. 
new to new to you. Right. So it's for you know it's for gamers and it's for uh, designers and I don't know who else it's for. We'll kind of see. That's what Kickstarter is all about too. Oh, yeah. is Figuring out who your market is, um, and that's going to start the first of April. Okay, so right around the corner. Yeah, so my goal is to have the book. It's a terrible, I'm never going to get this, but I want to have the book like written by the 1st of April uh, and in editing, and I want to be able to send it off to press by the end of the campaign. Just get it out of the house and begin my life of relative leisure. <laughs> so what's it been like trying to go back and put all this information together? I mean, do I have, you have like a nice file system that uh, you I have I have from? a terrible <laughs> filing system. It's a, it's a, it's a not a funny joke. Um, I I still have a Wall Street Power Book uh, from 1993, uh, Macintosh Power Book that hasn't been updated at all since 2003. So it still runs all the old programs, all the old zip disks, all the old uh, optical disks. Zip disks. Still had all the information. Everything was good. I have lost a couple of things, but all the stuff I could find was still working. So I pulled that all off into a format where I can generate PDFs and move it onto a modern machine. Um, and it's like cleaning out your attic. There's just so much stuff there. I'm mostly on the discs, and I'm mostly focusing right now on the games themselves. And so there's not a lot of surprises in there. But as I go through old paper folders and like tear sheets from magazines, reviews, and ads that we ran, which I kind of ignored the ad folders and all the old discs, but I'm looking at the print ads going, these are funny. So some of those ads are going to wind up in the book too, there's there's one that's just got the zombie from Friday's like like screwing light bulbs into his head, and the caption is "Cheap ass games, a nerve tingling waste of good ideas." <laughs> <laughs> that's a tagline right uh, there. That's that's, good. We had so many good taglines. I found one that was just a blank half page ad that said right, in tiny text down through the middle, "Ah, the sweet smell of cheap ass." Like I don't even know, <laughs> I don't even know what <laughs> what. <laughs> catalog or magazine or whatever this was in but it's like you know who we are just 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 go buy one that's awesome that was fun so what's it been like digging through your old creative folders and seeing the growth that you had with these games i did my that? best work when i didn't know what i was doing there's been no growth <laughs> uh is that just because you you kind of pigeonhole yourself into like the rules of how you're supposed to design no, I, things i don't or? think so i think i mean i i do believe i'm getting better but i also believe that like I'm trying harder stuff now, so sometimes it just doesn't work. Right, right. I think a lot of the stuff I did earlier was sort of, you know, low-hanging fruit, easy to design games. And also, a lot of that game, a lot of that stuff really isn't very good. It was popular, but it wasn't really good. This, this, the book is a lot about this. It's like, this is the worst game in the catalog. And I won't, I won't spoil it for you by telling you which one I think is the worst. But <laughs> there's a lot of, of updates like that. They're just like, okay, we made this. And it didn't sell, and I think I know why, and here's why, and let's move on. <laughs> I mean, that's good that you're able to to do like a deep dive on that, and even like poke fun at yourself in the process, and be like, "Hey, look at this stuff that I did." It doesn't I, it, necessarily it, yeah, work, but it, I did it, it. It wouldn't be cheap ass if it weren't self deprecating, like right. to an extreme degree. <laughs> the you have to be at a specific point in people's minds to be able to brag about being huge and amazing, and people understand that you're kidding. Right. right. If we get too big and we start saying we're the best guys around, you're like, no, you're not. And you start arguing with this. But when you hear cheap-ass games say that, you're like, uh -huh, you know you're not. It's, <laughs> it's a whole different vibe. <laughs> but that, that's your sense of humor, though. That's what people are expecting to see. So, I mean, that works out nicely, too. Yeah, I did, I did humor games almost exclusively for a long time because that's what I knew how to sell. Mm -hmm. You know, Kill Dr. Lucky is the funny game. It's about killing an old man in his house, and he's really hard to kill. Like, <laughs> you know, you, you have to treat that subject lightly or it gets really weird. Oh, yeah. Um, so... One time, um, Jordan Weissman hired me to do P Pirates of the Spanish Main. Mm -hmm. And I don't talk about this game in the book because it's not you know, covered under the umbrella, but he asked me to write content for that game. He said, make us some ships and some characters for this. And I'm like, you know I'm a humor writer, right? Like, I, okay. So I wrote him a whole bunch of funny ships, like the pedestrian and you know, the equestrian and whatever. And he was like, this is not what I want. And I said, then you want someone else to write it. What are you doing? I mean, I designed the game mechanics. I'm not going to write your totally serious pirate game. So that's how Mike Salinger got involved, because he knows how to do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So it, it's such a different thing, though, uh, creating this book of your, your journey, if you will, through the design process. Uh, what inspired that? Uh... That's a good question. I mean, I'm always, I just, I kind of think that it's a product that I would like to have. Mm -hmm. I almost want a reference manual for all my games, like in one place. 
if I was a collector, I'd be like, do I have everything? Well, let me go check. There's like a list on BGG, and I'm not, I haven't looked at it lately, but I don't know if it's complete or not. But this is like, this is what it is. It's kind of a, a delivery mechanism, too, to say to my new corporate masters, this is what you bought. You know, here, enjoy. Take it away. The cheap-ass anthology. Yeah. That's really cool. So as you're moving on into the, uh, the your free time, that you were saying before, well, it isn't free. Yeah, it it does come with a with a <laughs> with a cost. I get paid to do game design. I mean, that's always uh, a good whatever. Thing. Yes, it's free time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what kind of games are you working on developing right now or designing right now? So at the moment, um, I have this is one of those like difficult, far reaching games. I have a, a property called Dewpoint that is. Uh, it's an RPG scenario. It's a whole world with characters, and the, the world itself has a storyline. And you know, it's a it's a sort of steampunky fantasy universe mm-hmm. that I've been developing for fiction. And I showed this game, the, this universe, to the people at Greater Than, and they said, "We want the game that you make in this." And so I'm working on a sort of resource management game that's set in that world hmm. in a way to sort of help me develop the intellectual property of the world but also to make a game that, that they want to sell um, I'm working on sort of a it's not a licensed Game of Thrones game but it's a it's a high fantasy you know takes itself too seriously but is funny kind of you know card game uh, for another publisher I'm working on a casino game I'm trying to sell a casino game right now which I have been for years um, how do you go about pitching a casino yeah, it's game? A, it's a mess that industry is a mess <laughs> If if you, you you can think of hobby gaming and casino gaming as two opposite ends of of pretty much every spectrum mm-hmm. in terms of how much money is in the business you know all of it's in casino how much creativity is in the business all of it's in hobby mm-hmm. and they sort of m- filter through this lens of of digital games which is kind of halfway in between like right. like there is creativity but there like not as much originality in digital games because most of them are copies of existing games because mm-hmm. you have to do that because it's expensive to make something new all the time oh absolutely right on our side we got no risk. We got all the free time in the world. We can make up new stuff all the time and see if it works. That's what Cheap Ass Games was all about, was just throwing stuff at the wall to see what would stick. Throwing the handful of spaghetti at the wall. Yeah. Uh-huh. And one, one strand sticks, and you're like, okay, make a nice version of that. And then the casino, it is so hard to get a new idea approved. and, and Right. I and mean, you don't see new games in the casino that often. You see about 20 new table games a year. You see a lot more on slots. There's slots, right, yeah. Right, definitely. slots are easy to reprogram and do new art and new bonus games and whatever. Right. I'm, not, I'm not saying that they're easy, but they're easier. Right. And they're, e- they're also easy to install because they use the same hardware. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to teach a dealer and so on and so on. So, yeah, it's a, it's a tough business, but it could be really lucrative. And so I'm kind of l- trying it. I have been going to the casino industry trade show for now probably 10 or 12 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, I learned first that if you don't have a patent, there's nothing for anyone to buy. So you have to get your game patented. Mm-hmm. But th- this is, I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying it's the first thing I learned. Because then I learned that you can't get patents anymore. It's almost impossible <laughs> to get a new game patented because everyone comes to them with new games that are like blackjack variants or side bets or whatever. Right. And, and the patent office is like, just Go cut it out. This is not what we're here for. <laughs> we're here for new machines and actual you know, new inventions and not like one new rule for an existing game. Right. So the industry somehow runs on this fuel that you can no longer get. So and it's that's even harder to get your foot in the door then because you well, have to yeah, find the Yeah, and that's just one slice of how hard it is to get your foot in the door. You basically have to know somebody. Right. You have to be a friend of a friend. You have to exhibit. You have to, you know, spend money, just crazy money to get even even the, the exhibits, but then to, like, get meetings with people and, oh, it's a mess because there, there are gatekeepers everywhere because there's so much money in it, right? Right, I mean, absolutely. that's just the way it is. So I made a game called Ricochet Poker, and I invented this game about... F- Maybe five years ago, four or five years ago, I'm mm-hmm. guessing. Don't look it up. Um, <laughs> filed for the patent in due course and actually got a patent this summer. We got granted the patent, oh, which is weird. Like, that never happens. And that got a lot of people interested uh, in picking the game up. Not that we have a contract, but they're interested in looking at it. Right, right. Um, I exhibited it at the Cutting Edge Table Game Show in uh, Las Vegas in November. Mm-hmm. And they have a little contest in which we won second place. Nice. First place is like automatic installs in six casinos. Second place is a little glass trophy. So I would have much rather won first place. But typically at that show, games exhibit for like two or three years before they win first place. So we're going to take it back again next year and try again. Oh, so it's you can continue to enter. You, with yeah, you, you, you exhibit again. You ask the people which one they like this year. And you make some slight tweak 
you know, to make it slightly better. So but it sounds like a lot of politics too. Oh my god, yeah. yes. Um, it's like I said, it's just a it's a catastrophic mess. But um, but it could be pretty good money. And one, I feel like th- this game, Ricochet Poker, is like a foot in the door that it at least gets me contacts. So the next time I want to write a casino game, it should be a little easier. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> So, do you have anything to show off for Ricochet? I can poker? show you Ricochet if you want. I'm to see actually it. very interested. It's a in pretty that, simple yeah. game. I mean, the requirements of a casino game are strict. I can imagine. Uh, it's not just about math. It's about being able to teach a new player instantly. You need to be able to be drunk, stand at the table, watch one hand, and feel qualified to sit down. Yeah. Which you got to know, you couldn't do that with a hundred percent of the hobby games on yeah, the floor. Yeah, there's right? there's maybe two that I would say that I'm comfortable right. with to do that. Yeah. Um. So. It's basically poker that's played face up, okay, um, against the dealer. So, so I'm the casino, I'm the house, mm-hmm. and I'll deal a few hands. We'll have to imagine chips, but I'm going to give two cards to every player, uh, and I'm going to give five cards to myself. So right away, you know the dealer's hand. Okay. I'm not going to improve this. This is what it is from the get-go. That's and it. it is, and it's not a shared pot game like Texas Hold'em. Everyone has their. I'm sorry, it is a shared pot game. It's not a shared hand game. Okay, we don't have any community cards. Gotcha. But we are putting all the money in the same pot. So the dealer bets a nickel. Everybody else bets a nickel. That goes into the pot, and now we we're ready to begin. Mm-hmm. It's called Ricochet Poker because the action doesn't just go from left to right. It goes to the lowest hand. So in this, the lowest hand is a ten nine. So why is that the lowest hand? Because it's the lowest poker hand. It's the ten, the ten high. Oh, ten high. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this player's action is either to fold, or to pay a second bet to get the rest of his cards. So you make just one decision, mm-hmm. and if you buy the rest of your cards, I'll do that. You got a pair, pair of nines, nines now, and I'm going to fold any five card hand that's beaten by this. So the dealer's just got a queen high. The dealer's already out. Okay. okay. We go to the next player. That's the jack five. The jack five is going to play. He gets a pair of fives, but that's not good enough to beat a pair of nines. The jack queen goes, gets no pair at all. And the ace four, remember, every one of these has been paying a bet into the pot. So this player is getting like eight to one to try to get a pair that beats a pair of nines. Huh. Right? So uh, with a four, that's still not a great, but let's say say he does it. He gets no pair and he's out and his bet and everybody else gets shoved over here. And that's the end of the hand. It's that quick. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. So the decision you're making is whether you think the pot is offering you enough odds to try to become the best hand. Hmm. And uh, and it and it uses the rules of poker. You you have to know poker hands to play it. Right. So it's not the resolution of the hands isn't mysterious. Right. It's the not me- a foreign concept to right. anyone either. The mechanic yeah. is new, but that's like pretty simple to pick up. And uh, and and there you have it. And of course, we had to do math to figure out how the dealer where the house has their advantage. And right. And uh, there's a couple of rules you didn't see, but all the gotcha rules, all the rules I didn't explain, are all good for the player. Mm-hmm. Um, that's one thing that's really irritating about a lot of new casino games is they sort of feel like they're good for the player until suddenly you get smacked on the hand for winning, right? <laughs> You'll, oh, this seems perfectly fair. Oh, it is perfectly fair. And that's why every time you win, you pay the dealer 5%. <sighs> right? The, there's a, there's a, a blackjack game uh, where there are a lot of very good rules for the player. You know, you can do this and that and split and... and, and, and uh, but if the dealer gets 22... It's a push. Oh, free bet. Uh, well, I mean, this is a mechanic a that, like that yeah, this yeah. is a mechanic that's manifest in several games now, and it's really frustrating when you thought you knew how the game worked. Yeah. You re- you learn one more gotcha rule and you lose. Right. But in Ricochet, the gotcha rules are this: number one, if the dealer's hand is too good, the dealer folds. What do you mean if the dealer's hand is too good? I mean, based on a table, and the table varies with the number of opponents that the dealer has. Right. If I have, let's say, two pair or better against three players, I will just leave my bet. And, and in the pot and take my cards away because I want you guys to win more money. Huh. And if you get a hand that's good enough, like a straight or better, baked into your initiating, initiating bet, you get more money whether you win the hand or not. So if you get a straight, I'm going to give you two bets and we're gonna, then we're going to keep playing. If you get a flush, I'm going to give you five bets. Oh, that's so cool. here's more money just for playing a hand, right? And all these are gotchas, but they're all good for the player. Oh, look, I just got free money. Oh, the dealer just left, right? Yeah. Um, we have the license, the ability to do that because the house advantage is so huge in the core game that we can sort of give it back in, in those uh, extra rules and still, uh, still have a profit. Hmm. So, so yes, we're pretty happy with this game. That's swanky. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I have an agent who's in uh, Las Vegas right now pitching this game to anyone he can show it to. And, you know, 
I don't know what interest looks like when it's not an actual contract in my hand, but it sounds like they're interested enough to have more meetings, so that's that's good. That's good. Yeah. That's very good. Yeah, that's, so that's one of the things I'm doing right now. All right, James, anything else that you want to talk about today? <laughs> I, I don't know. Ask, I, that's the, I, yes, it's a dangerous of question I'd, to ask, I'd right? love to talk about, uh, you know, the, wh- the price of wheat. <laughs> What is the price of wheat? I don't, right I'm, no, not I'm not even no familiar. Idea. I was yeah. just making that up. Oh, I guess that's yeah. how much you pay for wheat, but I don't know. <laughs> I've never done it. A loaf of bread costs this much. I don't know. <laughs> my day. In my day. In my day, you could get a pretty good board game for five bucks. There's a little company called Cheap Ass Games. <laughs> <laughs> tell print, me more about that. They print them. them in black and white. <laughs> no, I tell you what I want to do with with my so called free time, as well as doing freelance work and, and casino game stuff. I have, as you might imagine, kind of a back catalog of games that are not worth doing which okay. is to say if i have to like manufacture 10,000 of this and sell it at a profit it's never going to get made but if i can make a free copy and give it away and if somebody likes it they can have it well then i would make that game like i have i mean there's so many games but like one of them is called too many notes and it's basically the amadeus game right you're all composers in salzburg or vienna i forget and you're trying to either become the court uh, composer or murder your rival. So you get a secret rival at the beginning, and if that player dies, then you win. Uh, and you're sort of spending your health points to try to become the best composer uh, in the main game. Like, that's all there is. There's no game yet. And I want to make that game, but I don't think that I could make a profit on that game. So it would have been a cheap-ass game 20 years ago. Right. But what is it now? It's, it's a backlist thing that, I, that I'm going to work on when I don't have to sell it. So you could really tell that this is a passion for you, then. <sighs> I like making games. I'm pretty good at it. I'm not good at the other stuff. <laughs> well, here's to looking forward into the future and being able to do that with more of your time. Yeah, it was good to, good to see you. All right, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Really do appreciate it. And thank all of you for watching at home. Stay tuned as we continue the coverage here at Gamma 2019. But for now, signing off, I'm Matt. Have a good one, everyone.